about to shift gears into our program for the evening. And um, <laughs> I just want to say welcome to our first you know, online training series for the Kitchen Table Climate Conversations. We have had two previous trainings and uh, they were in person at Friends House in Toronto and some of you may have been to those, uh, but this is the first time for us to be online. And we'd like to start our evening with a land acknowledgement. So I'll hand things over to Val. Good evening, everyone. I've prepared a land acknowledgement that consists of bits taken from others and some of my own. We acknowledge the sacred lands on which we live and meet today. These lands have been the sites of human activity for over 15,000 years. Toronto is situated on the ancestral lands and waters of the Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and many other Indigenous peoples, and is presently home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One, Sp one Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Later, when making treaties with the European settler governments, Indigenous peoples continued to observe the concept of sharing. However, Europeans believed in the concept of private ownership. Treaty 13, also known as the Toronto Purchase, has been disputed for over 200 years until in 2010, when it was finally settled with the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. However, the Mississaugas of the Credit continue to claim unextinguished Aboriginal title to the Rouge River Valley Tract, and in 2015, they submitted a claim which has not yet been settled. Indigenous people are currently living the consequences of colonialism through the exploitation of Indigenous lands, systemic racism, and cultural appropriation. Despite contributing the least to its causes, Indigenous communities are disproportionately vulnerable to climate change due to their close economic and spiritual ties to the land. We strive to help heal the wounds of our past and our present through educating ourselves and respectfully engaging with Indigenous peoples and by working to restore the earth through action on climate justice. And we gratefully follow the leadership of Indigenous people as stewards of the earth. Towards this end, I invite people to think about how we might move from a simple land acknowledgement to a living commitment to Indigenous rights. For example, close to home here in Toronto, in Pickering actually, the Duffins Creek wetlands are being threatened by the building of a warehouse. The wetlands are of particular importance for the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation because these were part of the Mississauga territory until 1923 when the Canadian government stripped Mississauga peoples of about 13 million acres of land through further trees, treaties that were called the Williams Treaties. In 2018, the federal government apologized for that and for the quote, insufficient compensation it had provided. Ontario is mandated to consult with Indigenous communities on decisions that may infringe on their rights or title. Chief Kelly LaRocca of the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation says that the Ontario government has thus far failed to consult with her on the development project at Dufferin's Creek. To learn more about this issue and efforts to stop this development, uh, please follow the link that I'll put in the chat shortly. Thank you. Thank you, Val. <laughs> Okay, so I will just to give you a bit of a description as to what's happening tonight. As I said, it's the first online training that we've done. And we are offering this to a wider community. We're really glad to see people here from outside Toronto, from other parts of Ontario and across the country. Um, we, we have the hopes of spreading climate conversations farther and wider through the grassroots outreach work that all of you will be doing. We are offering this training as part of the gift economy. It's our gift to share with you. We are a volunteer organization and, and we invite you to join us and uh, we'll make a contribution in whatever way you would like. We'll include the donation link if you would like to help us continue the work we are doing. This is totally optional. 
There are many ways to give to this turnaround decade, this transition we are all part of creating. In this series, we encourage you to be willing to step outside of your comfort zone. We aim to provide you with a model for a conversation that can be adapted to many different settings and audiences, from your friends and neighbors to work colleagues to your faith community. We invite you to reach out because the climate crisis will only be solved when we form one very large team. We could even call it Team Earth. As our goal is to hand on a beautiful living planet to those who are young now and the generations yet to come. We want this to be a safe and beautiful space for the huge diversity of living creatures on our planet, for so many to continue to experience the mystery and magic of this living planet. So this is our moment to step up and to form groups that will help everyone to see how they can fit in, how personal change and political change both have their place. Many people don't have any idea how they can help or how we can work together and solve this. But in an, in an emergency, we call for all hands on deck and that is the time that we are in right now. So Colleen, can you please say a word about tonight? Sure, thanks Lynn. Well, to face the climate crisis, talking about the changes we need to see and working together is vitally important. And we have the chance as we move towards a recovery from COVID-19 to build back better to push for transformation, for good green jobs, and for actions that center justice and truly protect people and the planet. As Lynn said, now is the time. And for tonight, so what are, what's on the agenda for tonight? Um, for this first webcast in the series, with the help of our speakers, we'll start by exploring the importance of these conversations and the urgent need for climate justice, adjusting green recovery, and prioritizing people's health and well-being. After that, we're going to follow up with a 10 minute Q&A session. So if you have any questions uh, throughout the evening, just put them in the chat and our moderator, Anna, will collect them up. If we don't get to your question in that 10 minutes, we are going to try to follow up um, and, and make sure everyone does get an answer. In the second half tonight, we're going to do some breakouts focused on how to talk about the climate and facilitate climate conversations. And the first set will be um, introducing the kitchen table climate conversational model. And in the second set of breakouts, we have three inspiring climate com communication techniques to choose from. And again, we are recording most of the breakouts, so you can still catch up on what you what you miss. Um, so that's what's happening tonight. And I will let it go back to Lynn to describe what's happening in the next session. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Colleen. For the second session, we will go through a model conversation. And in that conversation, we'll consider the method of social change. What will it take to bring out the transformation that we need to see? So that'll introduce everybody to the model. And uh, in the third session, we will not only learn the basic technical skills to offer a Zoom conversation, uh, Ray is going to take us through all of that. We will also hear from folks who have offered conversations. So we'll hear their stories, which will be hopefully inspiring us also making it sound as easy as we hope it will be to actually do this. We, we want this to be an accessible method that everybody can use and spread far and wide. So in the fourth session on April 15th, April 12th, sorry, Collective Courage, we're calling it, we will delve a little more deeply into how to tailor a conversation for specific groups. And the last part of the KTCC agenda, which is actions and solutions, ways of working together and supporting one another. So all of the sessions fit together as a whole. You do need to register for each one separately. Um, and we hope as many as possible of you will be able to come to all of them. And we also look for your feedback. So we will have a survey link at the end of the program. and. Um, you know, we're just really glad you're here. So over to Colleen for. Yeah, so there's just a couple of housekeeping items and Ray, our tech lead has kindly prepared a, um, a, a slide for us. If you would put that up, Ray, that would be great. Looking at it, I'll just run through a few of the things. Um, of course, if you stay on mute, except when um, we're doing participatory things that will help, um, it'll help reduce the background noise. Um, the, if you can see at the bottom of your screen, there's probably a reaction button for you, and you're welcome to use any of those reactions throughout. 
Um, if you have a question, please do put it in the chat um, and we will get to it. And if you notice, we are actually trying out closed captioning. So on the bottom of your screen, you should have either a more button and in the more button, it'll say show subtitles, which you're welcome to turn on, or you might have a closed caption icon right there. If you have any trouble, including with the, the closed captioning or anything else, uh, just let us know in chat or actually private message one of the tech team and all of the tech teams has tech written before their name. So with that, I want to thank you again for joining the conversation tonight and go back to Lynn to get us started. So for you, start and then Siegfried is going to come right after you. OK, this is the two speakers from Fridays for Future. And we're very glad to welcome you here tonight. Um, there will be an event on March 19th that we should hear more about. And uh, we are always glad to support what Fridays for Future is doing. So Sophie Kraus is going to speak first. Sophie is a 17-year-old youth climate activist with Fridays for Future Toronto. She does research projects and writes for social media, newsletter, and informative content. She also frequently takes part in online actions. Since early childhood, Sophie has been passionate about protecting biodiversity and bringing awareness to social inequities that discriminate against marginalized communities. And she hopes to dedicate her life to environmental justice. So a big welcome to Sophie. And right after Sophie will come Siegfried Hemming. Um, and Siegfried Hemming also with Fridays for Future. Uh, and I should say Sophie, is she her? Siegfried, is he they? And uh, Siegfried writes that Fridays for Future Toronto is the local chapter of the Fridays for Future Global Climate Strike Movement, a youth-led grassroots organization with the primary mission of mobilizing to demand climate justice through the organization of school strikes, rallies, and marches. Fridays for Future Toronto recognizes that the climate crisis is not only an environmental crisis, but a social justice crisis too. We have adopted a number of intersectional demands. When I say we, I mean Fridays for Future. Um, and they aim to create a space for youth to advocate for a better world that uplifts marginalized voices, follows the principles of climate justice, and empowers youth to demand a future that is sustainable and just for all. So welcome to Sophie and Siegfried. Please go ahead, Sophie. Thank you, that was such a great introduction. Um, I'm just gonna hop right into it because I only have a few minutes. Um, so I've had many conversations with my peers concerning why I've chosen to take action against the climate crisis. People approached me out of curiosity and usually had some idea of what climate change was. However, since I've continued with activism, I've inevit inevitably run into many people who oppose my opinions and beliefs. And it wasn't until I met these types of people that I realized I had made such a weak effort to analyze how I went about these conversations. I never really had much structure to my arguments, and I also ignored the impact of sparking emotion in others. So through much reflection with climate and social justice dialogue, I formulated some advice for anyone seeking to start these difficult conversations. My experience in climate dialogue is greatly impacted by my age. As someone who is active in discussions surrounding justice issues in our society, I am often overlooked solely for my youth. I constantly feel the need to prove my credibility with a plethora of evidence to support my arguments. For so long, politics has been run by old white men. So when young diverse activists challenge the current political models, we are seen as a threat. As a result, they judge us by the one thing they feel they can, our age. In political conversation, young means naive, uneducated, and much more, which adds more pressure, especially for youth and BIPOC activists to be able to have meaningful dialogue. Sparking effective dialogue with someone begins with a purpose. Why am I conversing with this person? What do I want them to take away from our conversation? How do I listen to and address their concerns while still pushing the urgence for change? I try to ask myself these things before I even begin facilitating these heavier conversations. We don't need much guidance concerning how to have conversations about climate with other climate activists because we all understand the urgency, the need to take action, and the need to spread the message. I'm talking about those harder conversations where you may feel uncomfortable, where the person on the receiving end might not like what you have to say. Nonetheless, I found it's important that you balance the use of emotion and fact according to your audience and your setting. As an example, if I were to approach my MPP, who in my opinion is a right wing, uneducated and bigoted 22 year old man about a just green recovery, I would try to shy away from my own personal feelings. 
And these types of, po sorry, political atmospheres, people in opposition to radical ideas will be more keen to acknowledge your propositions when supported with statistics, rather if they were supported by your feelings of terror for the state of our environment or your own future, which by the way, those feelings are totally valid. Doing research about what a just green recovery means, what it would look like in Canada, how fossil fuel workers would be accommodated, how our economy and environment would be impacted, all of these statistics are prime examples I use to facilitate conversations in political kind of atmospheres. Remember to vet your sources and prepare yourself to defend your ideas. Letting emotion take impact, though very useful in some circumstances, can be your greatest enemy in a political setting. Anger, fear, and sadness, though very valid, do not prove the need for legislative change. Providing concrete evidence of an evolving disaster that could be improved by a just green recovery is what will catalyze that needed change on a legislative level. However, we are human. We can't ignore our emotion. So when should we use emotion in climate dialogue? Use it when you want it to connect with real working class people. Being able to convey emotion to others can have a drastic impact on the way one may view a topic. Voice your anger and show the people how the crisis will affect the future of all youth. Show empathy and concern for others, especially BIPOC communities who are disproportionately exposed to ecological impacts of the climate change movement. Show your solidarity for indigenous nations who dedicate their lives to protecting the land which has been stolen from them. However, never forget your purpose and your proof. Why should people be worried about their future? How will you show the public that they will be impacted by the crisis, whether they believe in it or not? Show them the billions of dollars we'd save if we committed to fully renewable energy by 2040 and the new jobs that would be created in this sector. What I'm trying to get at is to strike a chord with people where they'll feel it most. Enter the conversation with the intent to understand what your audience cares about and show them how they will be affected as individuals. Because as I'm sure many of you know, the all encompassing nature of the crisis, you know that not one person is excluded from climate chaos. There will come a point when not even the richest 1% can throw enough money at their protection. Many people, especially in North America, don't believe in climate change because they can't see it. If they cannot watch the water come above their knees or the forest get clean cut or their houses turn to ash, then it doesn't exist in their reality. Show them their future, but most importantly, show them hope. The era of renewables is upon us, and there are more incredible technologies than ever before that are cleaning our water, capturing our carbon, and reinvigorating our ecosystems. Each day that goes by, the climate justice movement grows. I refuse to believe that my generation will fail to limit climate change, and I refuse to believe that we as humans will put profit over each other. I will dedicate my life and everything I have to solving the climate crisis, one day and one conversation at a time. That was so good, Sophie. I love that. Um, so hi, my name is Siegfried Nikolovs Echo Hemming, and I'm an environmentalist with the Fridays for Future Toronto. Um, and I think everyone knows here that normal is not good enough and that change is required at a systemic and personal level um, because we live in a system that capitalizes off of destruction and vice. But I think it is very important to illustrate just how capable of a society we are. The capitalist oligarchy that holds us hostage is not immutable and it is not invincible. Each individual holds immense amounts of power. The system we live in is designed to teach us to stay in our place, do as we are told and, and keep our heads down. But this is not the only way, especially if we topple the triangle upside down. Something I've heard a lot of as somebody fighting the climate crisis is, well, what about the child laborers in Malaysia? Or what about my problems? As if the climate justice movement and the social justice movement are mutually excuse exclusive, which they are not. The whole thing is intersectional. And if it weren't, we would just be reproducing the toxic environments that is creating these problems in the first place. Fighting for one cause does not bring the other down. This is why. Um, this is why when talking to one about the climate movement and they think they personally are not capable of fighting for a cause as hard or as they should, it is important to remind them that the quantification of work being equivalent to how much you are worth as a person is capitalist propaganda designed to shame you for not outputting profitable labor. 
The climate movement and many social movements are intertwined. I will use myself as an example. I'm a fairly privileged individual. I have a supportive and financially stable household. I am a white European. I have access to education and for the most part appear outwardly normal. However, I do have invisible disabilities and I'm a part of a demographic in which 20% are subject to physical abuse and or harassment in Ontario. I am transgender, I am autistic, and I am mentally ill. 20% of trans people in Ontario are subject to physical abuse in their lifetime. We're also more likely to be killed, fired, denied service, and ostracized just for being trans. Some other quick stats are 24% of trans Ontarians reported having been harassed by police. 50% of trans people in Ontario live off of less than $15,000 a year. And according to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, reports that people with disabilities, such as autism, were more likely than three times as likely to be victims of serious crimes, such as rape, robbery, aggravated assault, than people without disabilities. When put in the context of the climate crisis, we know that I would therefore be more likely to be much harder hit by the climate change. Now think about BIPOC peoples who are also autistic or transgender or struggle with mental illnesses. I can tell you from firsthand experience that people often like to use personal issues as a generalized excuse in order to avoid responsibility. Of course, the onus of this crisis should be placed on major corporations and billionaires sponsoring it, but people ignoring it is enabling those sponsors. This is where you can take the opportunity to provoke someone on issues about the climate. Why do you think fighting the climate crisis is less important than fighting ableism? Why do you think those two things are separate? Has someone said something to make you feel excluded from this movement? These are the kinds of questions that could prompt genuine answers without making the person feel shamed or inferior. This mass idea that everything is in separate boxes needs to be addressed. It is all connected. Trans rights are human rights. Being anti-racist is being anti-ableist and fighting the climate crisis is fighting the opioid crisis. I cannot stress enough the importance of emphasizing how addressing climate change does not mean not addressing any other issue when speaking to someone about the climate crisis. Oftentimes people lash out as a fear response. If they are angry at the climate movement, it is probably because they feel personally threatened by it. Let them know that they're not. Rather than blaming or increasing the heat with frustration, sympathize, relate, and educate. I truly believe that as soon as someone realizes the climate crisis threatens them and that fighting it aids them, they will begin to open up. Yes, we each have our specialties, but we are all fighting for the happiness and the safety of our fellow people. So next time you think you're not enough or you feel discouraged by somebody's strong opposition to climate justice, think again. It is not as black and white as it may seem. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Much appreciated your message about inclusion, being respectful, looking at a full and just transition is really, uh, is really needed. And one thing that I also really appreciate is the intergenerational nature of our work together. So we, all the groups I'm sure on the call today, all the people involved want to support the work of Fridays for Future. Um, and uh, we're just so glad to work with you. Thank you for starting us off tonight. Uh, I'd like to next um, introduce Steve Shellhorn. Steve is the Executive Director at Labor Education Center, which provides literacy and basic skills and an employment service. These programs are funded by the Ontario Provincial Government, and the Labor Education Center also has a pre-apprenticeship program for the construction industry called I'm Eglinton and provides fee-for-service skills training for union members. The Labour Education Centre was founded in 1987 and is a project of the Toronto and York District Labour Council. Welcome, Steve. Um, a couple of references have, have been made to Just Transition, and um, uh, that's what I'm going to speak about uh, tonight. I think it is important uh, for workers to know that the rest of uh, society has their back, uh, and will um, uh, assist them in the transition to uh, a low carbon economy or a net uh, zero uh, economy. 
workers uh, who are afraid to lose their jobs um, are likely to vote for politicians and political parties uh, that do not support uh, going to uh, net zero and can provide a political block. So I think it's in everyone's interest uh, to make sure that uh, workers uh, don't do not feel bo uh, bottled in by um, uh, transition to uh, a low low economy. Uh, low carbon economy. We looked at uh, phase out of coal in four uh, places in Canada, in the provinces of Ontario, and then Alberta, and in two uh, situations in Australia, one in South Australia and the other in the state of Victoria. And we came up with uh, the seven R's, seven general uh, areas uh, where policymakers sh uh, should be thinking of uh, putting programs in place to make it easier for workers uh, to transit uh, out of uh, fossil fuels. And so I'm just going to uh, uh, go through the list. I, I did have some slides that uh, may be on the uh, on the screen. And in the chat box, I put a link to the uh, 4K studies uh, that, uh, and uh, that's also where you'll find a, a list of the seven R's. So they are reemployment, retirement, relocation, reeducation and training, uh, redeployment, rehabilitation, and reinvestment. So reemployment is probably what we think of uh, most uh, grants that provide support for workers to, to transition to new jobs. Uh, the important thing here, though, and I learned this from speaking with uh, coal workers in Alberta who are about to lose uh, their jobs, is that um, the grants to provide support uh, for workers to tr transition to new jobs have to be in place before their old job ends, because there's a, a, a lag time in the training and looking uh, for uh, new jobs. Those are periods where workers will have no uh, income. And uh, that causes a lot of anxiety. Some uh, reemployment programs uh, maybe are only offered every six months or, 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 or once a year. So uh, it's important that uh, workers be able to uh, enroll in reemployment programs before they actually get their pink slips. The second, retirement. I think, again, this is fairly obvious, is that workers who are close to retirement but not yet eligible for their employer pension or perhaps their state pension, that financial support or bridging to get them uh, there earlier is really uh, an, uh, an obvious thing to do. Relocation, assistance to move uh, to a, a substantial distance to a, to a new job uh, should inc include moving costs and help uh, with purchase of, of a new home in case cases where workers do own their own their own home. Uh, Reeducation and uh, training, uh, again, uh, these are new skills or uh, change career options uh, need to be accompanied by in so income support that would allow the affected workers to access these programs. Redeployment is an option. If they're working for a large company, sometimes uh, they can uh, jobs can be created within the same employer, same employer, and that's certainly what happened in Ontario with the phase out of uh, coal plants in Ontario because it was uh, uh, the plants were run by Ontario Power Generation, a large employer. People were able to redeploy within the company. Rehabilitation, this is sometimes uh, the there is environmental remediation work that needs to be done the, at the coal sites and coal mines, so workers can be employed temporarily in the decommissioning or rehabilitation of uh, that, uh, that uh, site. And then finally, um, investment in the community. This would include both social and economic investment uh, to uh, ensure communities are not hollowed out by plant closures and maintain a sense of community prize, pride. This is uh, something that we found particularly important in Australia. Um, and that could include support for counseling services, services for victims of domestic abuse and family violence. When we looked in Alberta and the uh, closure of, of 
uh, coal plants in Alberta. As soon as the announcements were made, RCMP detachments uh, noticed a, a dramatic increase in domestic abuse and family violence. And that's just a reality that is that is not often uh, spoken about. But uh, there's also evidence of, uh, of that uh, uh, popping up in research in Australia as well. Uh, support for child care services to ensure that workers can ex access new employment training and re-education programs and income support to pay for food and ba basic expenses while displaced displace workers are retraining and education programs and public works and uh, recreation and infrastructure projects uh, in the local community. And finally, energy efficiency uh, projects for homes, businesses, and institutions. So those are the seven R's uh, that uh, should be kept in mind when we're looking at assisting uh, fossil fuel workers transitioning to a net zero economy. Thanks very much, Steve. Um, uh, really appreciate learning more about the transition uh, that we need for workers. Very important to include workers and provide for them. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'm now going to introduce Sarah. And um, Sarah Kamau is with the Africa Climate Action Initiative. Um, she's a change agent and entrepreneur. She's passionate about championing the rights of the less privileged through advocacy and community development. While living in Kenya, she graduated with her BA in the University of Nairobi and worked in many organizations, including in ref refugee camps and in the humanitarian field. Through these experiences, Sarah has witnessed firsthand loss of lives and livelihoods and forced migration due to climate change. Currently, Sarah is working as co-founder and coordinator of the Africa Climate Action Initiative, a CAP network initiative, that's climate, uh, sorry, Canada-Africa Partnership Initiative, to coordinate and build the capacity of African communities and partners to adapt and mitigate climate change. And ACAI, the Africa Climate Action Initiative is a partner of the Climate Fast. So I'm glad to introduce you, Sarah, to please share a few words with us. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Lynn. I appreciate and um, good, uh, good evening, everybody. I have a presentation that I'll just make here quickly. Um, my name is Sarah Kamau, as Lynn has mentioned, uh, co coordinator of Africa Climate Action Initiative. And um, the reason why I'm so passionate about this particular um, talk about climate is because I come from a family of farmers. And uh, with time, our uh, family cut all the coffee plantation and all the tea plantation simply because rain was not adequate. And, um, you know, our family became so depressed because of the issues of climate failed crop, you know, production and all that. And uh, my sister is a mango farmer currently. And every season, it's the same story. You know, she tells me, hey, help me pray. I don't know what I'm going to do because um, there's no rain this particular season. And that is why I'm so passionate about this particular conversation about climate change. So my presentation starts. Why am I so passionate? And I believe people are already tired because of every talk, every now and again, they hear about all well, they hear about is um, climate change. So as uh, Canadians here in Canada, I know as, um, she's, uh, as uh, my colleague Sophie mentioned that we are yet to feel the impact, but already the impact is there. The winters are much more warmer than possible than, than they have ever become. Look at um, our favorite beverage. Most of the coffee that we, we drink is actually coming from other countries and these countries are also affected by climate change. So you may think that climate change is happening in Africa, is happening in Asia, but it's coming much more closer you know, than we ever think. Uh, you may say, I'm, I don't drink coffee, I like my, my, my wine. But again, also, you know, um, all crops are being affected by climate change. You know, we thought that in the next 100 years, you're going to experience bushfire, we're going to experience uh, severe drought and mass extinction, but that is not the case. It's not 100 years anymore. We are talking about what is going on currently. You know, countries, according to UNHCR report, we are seeing that uh, we are having more and more climate uh, immigrants, uh, displaced immigrants as, as opposed to, to conflicts. 
you know, and all these people now are being affected, their livelihoods are being affected, people are being uprooted simply because of climate change. So where are these going, people going to be, to, 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 I mean, where are they going to move? They are going to move from Africa to Canada, to other countries. And that is why we are going to see an influx of even immigrants, an influx of uh, insecurity, an influx of, um, of, um, an influx of, uh, of conflict, simply because if you don't take charge. Uh, I'm grateful that we are implementing one particular project in North Etobicoke, where we are sensitizing people on reducing their own carbon emission. So it's imperative that as individuals, we take a role in doing that. Uh, we are seeing wild animals are dying in numbers simply because there's drought, there's a reduction. Um, as we started, you saw the clip where I said that um, you know, the, the, the bear was actually covering its head saying, oh, no, not again, not about climate change. And we can see the impact coming even much more closer home. Um, so as a bucket list, I recommend that uh, if you're not going to do anything, then we better do achieve all our bucket list. You've ever wanted to travel, go and see the animals that you ever desire to, to see, because what will happen in the next five years, in the next 10 years, those animals will not be there. According to IUCN report, we're seeing that um, <clears throat> over 160 species of animals between uh, have gone into extinction between 2010 and 2019. That is in a span of less than 10 years, you know? And um, uh, currently Kenya is hosting the only two female Northern white rhinos on the, in the planet. The last uh, male uh, rhino that was there was called Sudan. I was lucky to have seen it. So what are we going to tell our children, our great grandchildren? You know, what are we going to tell our children? That we had a role, that we were supposed to take an, um, a decision, but we never did anything, we were quiet. And that is the reason why it is imperative that we talk about these climate change issues. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sarah. So it's now my pleasure to, to um, introduce uh, family doctor, Antonia Sampong, um, who is the co-founder of Plastic Free Toronto and a general practitioner. Uh, she works with the homeless population in Toronto and understands the connection between individual health and environmental health and is a passionate advocate for access to healthy environments and social justice. As co-founder of Plastic Free Toronto, she works to educate and inspire her community to pursue low waste and sustainable lifestyles, while also taking actions on issues of environmental pollution, climate change, poverty, and institutionalized racism. Plastic Free Toronto regularly hosts community workshops, political activism seminars, movie nights, and beach cleanups. So welcome, Tony. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lynn. I'm going to just share my screen. Okay. We all good? We can see my screen? Fantastic. Okay. So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I'm going to be talking briefly about the connections between climate change and human health, and then also discussing why the solutions we propose to both of those issues need to necessarily make sure that they're including all people. So what is planetary health? Basically, this is the understanding that human health is reliant on the health of our ecosystems and our world more broadly. Obviously, a healthy ecosystem allows for us to build strong and resilient communities, which allow for things like employment, access to food, access to education, all of the things that allow us to be healthy and thrive. And so when we talk about climate change, we know that it's going to have profound impacts on human health. They've already said that we're going to see increased heat related illness. We're going to see increased in um, vector borne disease. So things like Lyme disease, mosquito borne diseases. We're going to see impacts in terms of things like human migration, food insecurity, water insecurity. So, so many things. So we can't really talk about human health without considering the health of our world. And so there are a couple of solutions that I want to talk about where basically we can improve the health of both the planet and the health of humans at the same time one of which is air pollution. I don't know if you saw this article, it came out a few weeks ago. Um, there's a new study that basically shows that air pollution caused by burning a fossil fuel specifically is responsible for 8.7 million deaths worldwide, which is one in five deaths 
is directly attributable to fossil fuels, essentially, which is crazy. In Canada, it's about 13.6% of all deaths that's related to this. And this is because air pollution, basically, it causes increased heart disease, it causes lung disease. We know it can lead to cancers, we know it can lead to allergies, it leads to all sorts of problems. So then the question becomes, how do we fix this? And one of the solutions that's been proposed is to move towards something like active transportation, particularly in Ontario, where 40% of like our greenhouse gas emissions are coming directly from transportation. And we know that if we move to active transportation, so this is things like walking, running, cycling, using public transportation, we basically will drop our fossil fuel emissions, which will reduce air pollution as well, as well as improve our health because we'll be moving our bodies. So we'll see less heart attacks, we'll see less strokes, we'll see less diabetes and all of these wonderful things. So that's what we mean when we say a co-benefit. There's benefits for human health in doing this and there's benefits for the planet. Another thing I wanna chat about is healthy diets. I don't know if anyone saw this article or has heard about this. Apparently the milk these days doesn't froth properly and the butter doesn't spread anymore the way it used to. And the reason for this is they've started giving cows palm oil to increase the butter fat in the milk because essentially they had an increased demand for milk products and not an increased like production of cows essentially. So this was the solution. And it's just like mind boggling from both a human health standpoint and an environmental health standpoint. Already like without the palm oil question, like agriculture is responsible for 30% of our greenhouse gas emissions and about 70% of our water use. And it's like the leading cause of deforestation. And usually the reason for deforestation is so that you can have pastures for the cows. But now we need to add into that, we're also deforesting you know, rainforests in Indonesia and Malaysia so that we can grow palm to feed the palm oil to the animals. It's just, it's like mind boggling. And we know from a human health perspective, that's also really unhealthy. Palm oil by, has been linked by the World Health Organization to increased cardiovascular disease and strokes. And, in, and a diet that's rich in animal products we know is responsible for in combination with some other lifestyle factors like drinking alcohol and smoking and not moving, is responsible for 80% of heart attacks, strokes, diabetes, and 30% of all cancers. So a diet that is high in meat, particularly cows, is really not great for us and it's not great for the planet. This is just to show that the carbon footprint of things like beef is astronomically higher than things like lentils. So ideally what the solution is, is to shift our diets and our agricultural systems towards more plant-based diets. Um, which we know like when you look at sort of population studies, there's about a 12% reduction in all cause mortality if you are vegetarian or vegan compared with if you eat the standard American diet, which is high in sugar salts and animal fats. All this to say, my last point here is like, so when we look at these solutions that we propose, so like things like active transportation, things like healthy diets, the question becomes like, can we all access these things? Because frankly, if we can't, we will not see the benefits that we need either from an environmental perspective or from a human health perspective. Both of those things require access and access often, especially in today's world requires money. So for instance, in Toronto, there are currently one in three children who live in food insecure households and about 15% of all households are food insecure at this, at this moment, which is up from last year, of course, because of the pandemic. And so like to talk about, we then need to have them switch to plant-based diets that you know support local regenerative agriculture that are organic and you know easy on the planet like that's it's not realistic also if you live in a rural remote area there's no way you're going to be accessing these things so what what our job is like we need to implement these solutions in our own lives but also we need to be making sure that we are also fighting for the resources for those who do not have access to them to have access and so that's going to look like a lot of different things like you know fighting for basic guaranteed income fighting for living wages fighting for access to free public transportation all of these sorts of things that we don't necessarily think of as like direct things we need to fight for for health, they need to be on top of our mind because frankly, as Maya Angelou has said, like none of us is free until everyone can be free and all of us are in this climate crisis together. And that is it for me. So thank you all so much. Hey, thank you very much, Tony. Uh, for those who may not be aware, Tony has come out to the kitchen table climate conversations trainings we've done in person too. And we're really glad to have you again tonight to highlight that connection of health and climate. And I want to also mention a special thank you to Sarah for bringing in the international connection. We have to look at the global context we are in and the impacts that are happening in other parts of the world from the emissions that are coming from our part of the world. So thank you for bringing that connection in. And, uh, we're all learning a lot. I'm sure we're learning a, an enormous amount. Um, I hope people are. I hope you're enjoying the program so far. And what I'd like to do now is, is give an opportunity for uh, some Q&A, some questions.
I suppose I, I could just ask a general question of any of the panelists. If you would like to give a tip to, to someone who's speaking uh, in a climate conversation to others, um, what might you suggest? Like what, what is um, a tip? I, I know, I think Sophie, you gave us some tips at the beginning there about speaking to people who might not yet be understanding the crisis we're in and sacred. I think you also mentioned some of those. Uh, but if if you have a tip, I don't know. I mean, Tony, you've done quite a bit of education work with Plastic Toronto. Do you want to add some more tips? I'd say from our perspective, it's been more finding the connections that people already care about. Everyone cares about something. And frankly, like the climate crisis is large enough that pretty much everything ties into it at this point. So, you know, if they want to chat about, you know, I don't know, cars, like chat about cars. And if they want to chat about, I don't know, their jobs, chat about their jobs. Like, I feel like there's so much opportunity to talk about things like, you know, how the care economy is so important or how, you know, electric vehicles are going to be important, but also maybe not the entire solution. Like there's just so many different things. So like, if they're like really resistant to something, I wouldn't say the answer is to like really dig into that one point of resistance, like as much as possible, have a conversation, see where they're at, get to know them. It's building the connections. I think that's so much more important than the actual content of what you're talking about. And also like facts, I used to be about facts. Facts are fun. No one cares about them. They don't remember them. So like, you know, tell your story and why you care. And that's going to make so much more of an impact. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Tony. Uh, and um, we've got a question here. Uh, let's see where the question going. Uh, Petra had a question. Yes, certainly tell your story. That's important. Um, and the importance of citizen lobbying, that people can make a difference. Lauren is pointing out, uh, make your politicians your best friend, your local politician. Make sure they know what you care about because we often hear, I, I do a lot of climate lobbying too, and we often hear that that uh, MPs say nobody talks to them about this issue. So they may be worried and we actually know majority of Canadians are worried. Um, however, they're not necessarily letting their MP know. So that is really important to do. And there are organizations that people, we can introduce people to through these conversations where they can get support for doing that if they've never done that before. Um, so I have a question about the ideal number of people to invite to a Zoom meeting. And uh, I will just comment on that because our recommendation is anywhere from six to eight people um, to 10 to 12 people that you maybe don't want to go above 15 people because you want the opportunity for people to share in a circle and to be heard. We have many more people than that on our conversation tonight. So we're going to make use of breakout groups. That's how we're going to accommodate more people and give you the chance to share. Um, and if you want to do that kind of thing in a larger group, you could adapt the model to do that. But in general, if you want an, an accessible conversation with a group of friends, family members, uh, or so forth, anywhere from like, let's say six to 12 at Mapstone 15 would be a group that you wouldn't need to, to do breakout groups. They, they could be an option, but you wouldn't need to do them. So that would be our recommendation. And do we have any other answers or comments? Can I speak please? Lynn, can, can, can you see the questions in the chat? There's quite a few now. <laughs> oh, now there are. Yeah, I, sent you a, I sent you a list of questions that have been asked chronologically so far. Um, okay, so how do we express the urgency of the moment without scaring people off? Um, that I think you're going to get some tips on in the next section, so I won't go into detail on that now. Um, generating a coalition of climate and social action that is irresistible to politicians. That is what we're going to do through this process and through spreading these uh, far and wide. And let's see, what did I miss? Oh, okay. Um, we, we will have a survey, by the way. There's, gonna, there's a link to the survey, and I think it's already in the chat. And we welcome your comments because we will make sure that we address them in our upcoming. Um, sessions that we're that we're doing and uh, we will adapt our our process and one of the reasons that we're doing four sessions is we knew we couldn't cover everything in one evening about how to do this and we want to people to feel confident in using the process um, and we want to see that your questions are answered I have a feeling that we need to move on to our next session so um, I will just introduce you briefly. Um, we are dividing into groups and you will get 
introduced to the agenda and some materials that are going to be available to you to support you as either being a host or facilitator of uh, conversations in the future. So we'll introduce you to those. It's going to be about half an hour. We will divide you automatically into breakout groups. So don't go away. Don't anybody go away. You will, um, you will be in a, a breakout group and uh, we'll have about half an hour in those groups. And then we're going to come back together and we'll, we'll divide into groups to look more at communication and listening skills and just how you might feel about facility, sorry, facilitating or hosting a conversation in the future. So um, it's really wonderful to be having the conversation here and I'm glad we finally got into our groups and we're uh, back here and getting ready for the last half an hour of, uh, of our presentation tonight. And we will gather together again briefly at the end um, as well. So if I could just introduce the groups that are coming now um, and you can choose, um, choose a group, okay? So we're very fortunate to have three very skilled uh, trainers in communication skills with us tonight. Each of them has a different approach, a little bit different, and that you will be dividing you up into different groups to go there and you can have a choice. So we're trying to give you a choice for this part. So um, we have a wonderful opportunity to have Brianna Aspinall, founder of Carbon Conversations TO. And uh, she has turned her feelings of climate anxiety into grief and grief, sorry, into meaningful environmental action by forming Carbon Conversations TO. Um, she works as project manager as well at Park People. She's interested in supporting facilitating moments where we can all find our way to contribute to making our communities better. And in addition to leading a CCTO team, Brianna has co-developed and facilitated the Climate Action Facilitator training other workshops that help individuals explore their own emotions, values, and motives to act on climate change. We can put 15 people into a Brianna's group, um, and the others of you will, will go with either Vince Shute or Henry Way. And I'm going to give you a brief introduction to um, Henry and Vince right now. If you want to be in Brianna's group, you can put your name in the chat. Priscilla will count up until we have 15 and that'll be the group that goes with Brianna. So I'll introduce Henry first. Henry Way is a nonviolent communicator with the nonviolent communication process. Um, and she, he provides trainings and facilitation to activist community co-op and social service groups and organizations. He draws on the nonviolent communication process and other approaches for empowerment, cooperation and relationship building. And I can tell you from personal experience that uh, working with Henry and training with Henry is wonderful. So highly recommended. And Vince Shoot, um, he is a behavior change specialist and an experienced sustainability consultant, trainer and facilitator. Vince is trained in motivational interviewing and is a member of the MI network of trainers, a global network of MI practitioners researching training and raising the bar on MI practice. He has conducted these Climate Conversations, an evidence-informed workshop with over a thousand young people. Vince has also provided skills training workshops for hundreds of environmental educators and organizers in the United States and Canada. His areas of, of expertise include behavior change science, human factors and sustainability, energy and waste, metrics and evaluation and design of workshops. So I have also taken training with Vince, motivational interviewing, very interesting process. So you have those three choices and, or if you end up staying in the main room or want to stay in the main room, I'll be in the main room and we can have a conversation there as well. So um, do we have 15 people for Brianna? To the tech, please. Uh, you're, you're counting them up there. Okay. Yes. Uh, this is Henry. I'm just gonna add that the focus I was asked to cover today was around group facilitation. So we'll look at uh, handling challenges, if you have some that you want to discuss, and also, if not challenges, you know, different ways to, to get more out of working with groups and facilitating groups, handling their, um, you know, what, whatever concerns they come up with. So it'll be kind of a lab. <laughs> Thank you for adding to that. It's only half an hour, folks, so it's going to be a little bit on the informal side, but these people are, are, are all expert in managing groups. So any questions you might have about uh, communication in a group or what might throw you off in a, in a workshop, like what's the 
hardest thing someone might say to you, um, this is an opportunity to kind of uh, see what they have to say. Um, so there are 15 now for Brianna, so no more for Brianna, please. And just choose between Henry and Vince. And you can, um, I'm hoping our tech team will be able to direct you to the room you've chosen. As I say, I'll still be in the main room. So if at any point you need to come back to the main room or you prefer to stay there, that is an option as well. Uh, and I'll just take opportunity to thank our, our, our guest trainers tonight. It's simply a moment to thank people. First of all, I wanna thank all of you for taking the time to come tonight and participate in our session. I wanna remind you that there's a link to a survey that is in the chat. Maybe it can be dropped in the chat again. Uh, there will be a follow-up note coming to you. We wanna stay in communication. So as this beginning of a four part series and we hope as many of you as possible will come back to the next one in two weeks, which is the model conversation. Um, and uh, I want to thank as well, all our special presenters, um, Henry, Vince, Brianna, and all of our guest speakers beforehand. Um, and that was Steve and Sarah and Tony, the Dr. Tony. And we had also from Fridays for Future, um, two speakers we had. Uh, uh, and so we're very pleased to um, the Sophie and Sigrid that came. Um, and I'd like to also thank the tech team that put the event uh, together tonight. Um, Hen sorry. <laughs> Can I just interrupt you for one yeah, second? Yeah, you can. Sure, go okay. ahead. Our actual survey hasn't been put in the chat yet. I don't know if one of our tech team can put it in. The survey that's in there is a great one to do, but it's for Akai, who's our partner organization. So I don't know if Anna, if you have our survey to put in there too, that'd be great. Sorry, thank you everyone. Let's hear more thank yous. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Is yes, the get the right. Is the chat gonna be saved? There's a lot of good- Yeah, I, I believe we are saving the chat. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we, we will. Good. Yeah, thank you. Let us so, know where we can access it when when you send out the thank you. Yeah. Whatever. Okay. Yeah. Yes. The survey link will be in your thank you letter that you'll you'll receive okay. uh, hopefully a little bit later tonight. And um, you know, comments, questions that you have for us, we we want to hear those because we we really need to all work together to make this program a success. It's, uh, and we will offer further opportunities for people to come together and share their stories and learnings from, from doing sessions. And actually in our third session, along with the, the tech uh, training, we're going to have some of those uh, stories from people's actual conversations. And um, in the fourth session, we're gonna look at building this program going forward and how we can do that together. So we hope you'll come back again to those and we will record them as we're doing tonight. Um, and as I was doing with the thank yous, I, I was at the tech team, which includes um, Ray and Anna and Priscilla. And uh, please jump in if I'm missing anyone who's been contributing to tonight. Uh, we don't see necessarily the tech team, but they're, they're doing their best to give us a very good experience. And uh, we really appreciate that. And I want to give a special thank you. And of course, we had our facilitators for our breakouts included Val and I believe Anne was doing one and um, I want to thank Sharon for assisting with one and also I want to give a special thank you to Colleen. Colleen um, your leadership on this has been so outstanding and we just would not be here without everything that you put into this and uh, really let's all recognize how much Colleen has done to make sure that this program is available for everyone. Um, Colleen, would you like to add to any of the closing comments if you have something you want to? Sure, you're making me all teary, Lynn. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I just, there's so many people involved and I'm so thankful for everyone. And I really enjoyed the breakout with you, Henry. And I, I look forward to seeing the other ones and the recordings um, and the speakers. Oh, if you're all still here, I just want to say amazing. Um, and the tech team, you actually... Your, your support is so behind the scenes, but it's so essential. So yes. thanks to all of you. Yeah, yes. and Lynn, you've been great, Lynn. Thank you very much. And I'd like to just point out that everyone here tonight is a volunteer. Um, we, if you would like to contribute to some of the expenses that we have um, with Climate Fast, we would appreciate that. The, um, 
there's a, a donor box link on our website and also maybe it will get dropped in the chat again now. Um, so if you feel inclined to send, send a, a contribution, please do, but there's no obligation. By being a volunteer in this process, you are making a contribution to, and we very much appreciate it. Um, Climate Fast has other volunteer teams. Aside from the kitchen table conversation, we have a retrofit team. We have a webcast team that is planning other webcasts going forward. Um, we have an anti-racism team, and we have, um, we also, have other opportunities for people to get involved in helping with outreach and promotion. Uh, anything that you like to do, you could probably volunteer with us and we'd be very helpful for the time. So I'm just gonna give uh, a last thank you to people for coming from all over to our, our um, session tonight from all over the, the, the Ontario and also from other parts of Canada. And uh, we are just really delighted to have shared this evening with you. So. I think that's basically it. If I have forgotten anything, please jump in. But otherwise, I think we're ready to wrap up for the evening. And um, maybe we can unmute everybody and you can wave and just say hi and thanks and bye. And um, can we do that? Thank you. Thank you. Bye, bye, everybody. Bye. 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 In two Thank weeks. You so bye. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye -bye. Thank you guys so much for having me. It was an awesome Bye. experience. Thank you. Oh, it was great. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, Bye Lynn. Bye, Lynn. Bye, Bye. 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 Yeah. There's Lee. There's Lee. Yes, thank you to Lee. I forgot to thank my timer. She's, uh, I can't remember. Bye, Lee. Also, without her computer, I would have been in serious trouble. So. <laughs> yeah we are really a community so we are really a team and we're all part of the same team now team earth and we're just going to make that future happen because we're determined and we're going to keep at it so thank you all for your amazing contributions tonight yeah thank you all pleasure thank to see you, everyone thanks, friends and allies okay. thanks Vince thanks Lynn for all the hard work <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Great.